worship. Amen? Amen. Well, you can go in your Bibles to the book of 1 Timothy chapter 3. We have quite a bit to cover tonight, so uh, I believe that just to give you a fair warning, this might go uh, kind of like the micro machine at the beginning, very fast, fast talking, and then I'll try to slow down a little bit, and uh, we probably won't get to every single thing in this passage, but uh, I'll do my best. Um, I want to mention one more thing before we get into the text about, um, I think if you didn't get one of these, uh, try to grab one of these. These are the Next Steps cards. These are new to Cornerstone. And um, what, I, what I've been wanting to do for the last couple of years is develop a simple path, simple step path to membership at Cornerstone. And, um, and so we've just started distributing them to you so that you can know about them. I know many of you are already members um, but uh, the reason I bring it up right now is because along with what we'll be studying tonight, uh, that 3 by 5 card that you got, uh, if you do want to nominate someone to be a deacon, um, in order to do that, you need to be a, the person that you're nominating needs to be a member, and you need to be a member. Um, so membership is required to nominate someone that is a deacon in our church. Uh, if you want to know how to become a member, you need to just simply look on this card, and it will give you the four-step process of becoming a member here at Cornerstone. Understood? Cool. All right, 1 Timothy chapter 3, and we're going to be looking at verses 8 through 16, uh, and we'll read that here in a moment. But when the world looks for leaders, it looks for those with talent and ability, and often someone who is attractive and very confident, but when God looks for leaders, he doesn't necessarily negate those things, but when God looks for leaders, he looks for hearts that are devoted to him. That is the characteristic that we see over and over in the scriptures. And for example, 1 Samuel 16, 7 says, but the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or at the height of his stature because I have rejected him. For God does not see as man sees, since man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the, what church? Heart. So mainly tonight we're going to be talking about the heart. When we're speaking about qualifications for deacons, this is regard, in regards to the integrity, the character, and the moral attributes of a person, the heart of that person towards God. Uh, this is a simple truth. Before God makes someone a leader, he first makes them a lover of God. Uh, John MacArthur said it succinctly. He said, when God raises up people to serve in his church, he looks for those whose hearts are right with him. His concern is not about talents or abilities, but spiritual virtue. And so that is the major topic of our passage today in 1 Timothy chapter 3. And I want to basically just present to you two questions in regards to the passage. And the first is, what must a deacon do? And so we're going to be talking a little bit about function. And then we're going to basically answer the question, what must a deacon be? It probably should be, who must a deacon be? I don't know, but it sounds better like this. What must a, a deacon do? That's function. And then the second question, what must a deacon be? And that is qualifications. And so that's what we're going to cover tonight in verses 8 through, through 16. The first question, getting right into it, what must a deacon do? Now, mainly throughout the text, this text and all of the text of the scriptures, uh, we don't see a detailed list of what a deacon does. So, we look at the scripture and we see in chapter 3, verse 8, if you're there, say amen. What's the very first word? Likewise. Okay. What's the second word for? Okay. So some of you have those words switched, right? Some people, how many of you have deacons and then likewise? How many of you have likewise and then deacons? Okay. You don't have any of that. Zelma, get out of here. <laughs> Leave. Um, <laughs> what I want to focus on tonight, just at the beginning, is the word deacons. Okay. Because that's where we're going to get the function. It actually comes from the word itself. If we know what a deacon is to do, we need to know the, the meaning behind this word deacon. And so the, the, the deacon, the word deacon is the Greek word diakonos. And there are several different variations of this word. 
uh, when it's being used, depending on how it's being used, it can be used as a verb, it can be used as um, an office, which we'll see here in a moment. Um, and so there's different senses in which this word is used. But quickly, I just want to look at three aspects of that. Uh, the first is this. It can be used as the general act of service. And this is not in your notes, but I would encourage you to write this down. Um, when we're talking about the word deacon, you can just put that on your paper, the word deacon. Uh, and the Greek word is diakonos. It's D-I-A-K-O-N-O-S, just kind of like it sounds, diakonos. And the first way that it's used is the general act of service. This is the most broad sense of the word. It's the most that it's used. In the New Testament, this word is used over a hundred times. And mainly, out of those hundred times, mainly when it's used, it's used in this general, very generic, general, generic <laughs> sense, right? It means it's an act of service. Uh, one commentator said the original meaning of this word group had to do with perform, performing menial tasks such as waiting on tables. That definition gradually broadened to include any kind of service in the church. And when you think about this, and when I think about this word in general, the passage that I go to is Acts chapter 6. It sticks out in my mind. Acts chapter 6 verse 2 says this. It says, so the twelve, talking about who? Yeah, they summoned the congregation of the disciples and said, it is not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. You see, they knew that as the, as the uh, leaders of the church, uh, a pastor's responsibility, their main job is to study the word of God, uh, to teach the word of God, to preach the word of God, and to be praying for those that they are teaching. And so they wanted to dedicate their time to that, and so they they needed people to do the actual service in ministry, which in this time was literally what? Yeah, they were waiters, right? They were serving tab tables, and some of the people in the congregation were becoming uh, forgotten, so to speak, and being mistreated, and, and they needed help in this area. And so in Acts chapter uh, 6, verse 2, that word at the bottom, serve, is basically this word that we're talking about. Okay, it's, it's the general version of that word, diakonos. And so um, that is the way it's used also in John 2, 5, uh, where Jesus' mother said to the servants, whatever he tells you to do, do it. Servants here is the same thing. All right, same kind of understanding of the word. So there's this general idea of service, and, and it's an act of service. And then we have a specific word, Diakonia, which is the specific gift of service. So if you're writing notes, the first one would be a general act of service. The second one would be the specific gift of service. This is found in Romans chapter 12, verses 6 through 7. It says, it's speaking of the gifts that God has given to believers. It says, through, this, through the Spirit of God, however, since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to use them properly. If prophecy in proportion to one's faith, and here, here's our word, if service in the act of serving, or the one who teaches in the act of teaching, of course it goes on to name other gifts, but the point is that this is the same type of word used in a different way. Also in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 15, it says, Now I urge you, brothers and sisters, you know the household of Stephanus, that they are the first fruits of Achaia, and that they have devoted themselves to, here's our word, ministry to the saints. So I'm, I'm just giving you a broad painted picture of the word uh, as it's normally used in the New Testament. Ministry here is basically service because it comes from that root word, diakonos. All right? And so I, I know word study is probably maybe not the most exciting thing to you, but we need to understand this because from all this arises what we're going to be talking about tonight specifically in this passage in verses 8 through 13, and it's the specific office of service. So remember I told you, write these down. I know they're not in your notes. The general act of service, the specific gift of service, and then the last one is the specific office of service. Do you see, do you see the distinction? Give me a head nod if you, if you hear where I'm coming from. Okay, you following, you tracking with me. The, the, it's the same Greek word 
with slight variations, and it's used in different ways, but generally uh, it's talking about one specific um, thing. And so this passage in 1 Timothy 3 and also in Philippians 1.1 are really the only passages where this form of diakonos is used uh, in regards to a position of authority, the office of a deacon, or that post or responsibility. So it hasn't changed its meaning entirely. The root is still the same. But here in this passage, we're going to be talking about the office of service, the office of a deacon. Now, there's some things we need to take away before we get into these. First is this. All Christians are deacons in the most general sense. That's very important to understand. We're not talking about the office of deacon. We're talking about the general term deacon because the general term deacon, have you figured it out yet? What's the one main word? It's service. It's serving, right? To serve. If you have to come up with one word that defines what it means, what deacon means, it's serve. That is the word that best describes what we're talking about. So all Christians are deacons in the most general sense of the word because we're all called to serve. Some Christians are specifically gifted to serve, and so when they are walking in the Spirit, they will serve, and, and then there are those who are placed by the Lord into positions of, of the office of deacon and into that position of service specifically. So the common denominator in all of the uses and aspects of this Greek word diakonos is to serve or service. And so that is the function. That is, that is a very important thing to understand. When we're talking about a deacon, and even any spiritual leader, to be quite honest, uh, even a pastor, the, the, the greatest function, the thing that they are to do, but we're just talking about a deacon tonight, so we'll stick with that. If you want to know what they are to do, it's not make decisions. It's not what we normally think of in terms of decisions. Now, those things can be part of that because service is a broad term, right? And so serving is the function. If you want to know what a deacon is supposed to do, it's serve. Uh, Matthew 23, 11 is not on the screen. This makes perfect sense, though, that the Lord would choose people who serve or who have a servant's heart, because Matthew 23, 11 says what? Anybody know it off heart? But the greatest among you shall be your servant, right? The greatest among you shall be your servant. That's what he said to his disciples. They were all clamoring to be at the top. And he said, if you really want to be great, serve. So that makes sense that the Lord has set up the church in the manner that the greatest among the people in the church will be the ones that are servants. And that's how a deacon should be thought of, those who serve. Now, what that looks like practically, the Bible doesn't give specific instructions. That's left up to the, to the elders. What's another word for elder? What's another word for pastor? Bishop. What's another word for bishop? What's the fourth one? No, good guess, but no. We got pastor, elder, Bishop, that's true, but not official. I got you, and I got me, because I can't even remember. But I know there's another one. <laughs> Bishop, elder, pastor, it'll come to me. What's the other one? It's going to come to me in the middle of studying, or in the middle of... There's one more. other. They're all the same thing, right? Overseer, Dennis... You get a candy bar if you want it next, next, next Wednesday night. Overseer, yes, thank you. They're the same, they mean the same thing, but they, they highlight a different function of the, uh, the pastor, or the elder, the bishop, the overseer. Good job. Um, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> Matthew 23, 11, but the greatest among you shall be your servant. And so talking about the function, what does a deacon do? They serve, um, and so that is, that is the important thing to remember about uh, when someone becomes a deacon they can serve in multiple ways it basically comes down to what helps the pastor in terms of letting the pastor study the word of god 
prepare to teach and preach the word of God, to pray, to do the work of the ministry. Um, and so that could be anything from come in, let's have a meeting. We need to come to a conclusion because who should a pastor trust the most? Those who want to serve God the most. <laughs> and so he heeds their advice and their opinion. But ultimately the elders are the ones or the pastors are the ones that makes the, make the decisions. And the deacons are those who serve in very practical ways to free up the elders of the church. So everybody got that part of this, the functionality of it all? Now we're going to move on to the meat of the text here. We, we got all that out of one word, deacons, right? Um, but now we're going to look at what must a deacon um, be, all right? What must a deacon be? And we find that in this passage. And let's go ahead and read verses 8 through 12. It says, Deacons, likewise, must be men of dignity, not double-tongued or addicted to much wine or fond of sordid gain, but holding to the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. These men must also first be tested. Then let them serve as deacons if they are beyond reproach. Verse 11, women must likewise be dignified, not malicious, gossips, but temperate, faithful in all things. Verse 12, deacons must be husbands of only one wife and good managers of their children and their own households. For those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a high standing and great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. That's where we're going to stop tonight. Um, not, not the service, <laughs> but in reading the text. This passage makes it abundantly clear that the character and integrity of the deacon must be equal to the character and integrity of, listen, the pastor. There's no drop off from the qualification spiritually of a pastor to deacon. They are to be morally the same. They are to be spiritually same. They have the same spiritual requirements. And a lot of times we get off track in the church in general, the church in general, because we've made these, these offices out to be something that they aren't. We think, oh, well, deacons can just be just, you know, your average Joes, but they don't have to be as spiritual as the pastor. That's not what the Bible indicates. That's not what the text indicates. Everything says that spiritually speaking, the deacon's heart for God and for loving and pleasing God must be equal to that of the pastor. There is no drop off. Rather, they are identical. Um, there is one functional difference. What is it? Say it real loud. Teaching. The main difference in the roles of a pastor and a deacon is that the deacon does, is not required to be a teacher. That is one of the major differences. But everything else, for the most part, now you won't see it verbatim, but for the most part, the Bible, you can tell, is indicating, God's word is indicating, of Paul telling Timothy is saying, these guys, these servants, these deacons need to be spiritually basically the same as the pastors. And so um, the main difference is, is that of teaching. Why would that be? Why is the only difference teaching? True. True. Yeah, and that's their main function, is teaching, preaching, praying, those types of things. And what's the main function of the deacon? Exactly. So it's, it's really clear when you just simply take the Word of God for what it is, what things are and even why they are the way they are. So now you have a list before you, and we'll, go, we'll rattle through these pretty quickly. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to raise your hand while we're going through them. And what I've done is I've put the, uh, I've put the, the qualification there in your notes, in quotes, in red, and then I left a blank, and, and I'm going to put in that blank my best simple, and I mean simple, interpretation, okay? It's not going to be exact, and it's probably going to be lacking but I left a lot of space for you so that as we study each point, if there's something that, that just kind of jumps out to you and you, you say, that really helps me wrap my head around this qualification, write that down, all right, and even put it in your own words. We don't want to get away from what the text is saying or what the literal words mean, but sometimes some of these things are a little bit difficult to, to understand in our vernacular, all right? So the first one is what? Men of... In, uh, men of dig dignity or integrity. 
Uh, the literal translation means serious or stately. It's this idea of being serious in mind as well in character. And I, as I was studying, I found out that literally the, the Greek word used, the, re, the root meaning of the word means to venerate or worship that person. Now that seems contradictory to the Bible, right? You shouldn't worship anybody but, but God. But it's showing us that idea of you look up to that person. They are so well respected and they are, they are dignified in a sense that you are in awe of them. And that is to be the character quality of a deacon. John MacArthur says those characterized by it have a majestic quality of character that makes people stand in awe of them. That's hard to find these days, isn't it? It's hard to find men that you just really are in awe of spiritually and you respect, and not in this church, of course, but in the world in general, right? It's hard to find people like that. And so that is a must have. That is one thing I wanted to mention that all of these things, if you look at verse 8, if you're with me, say amen. It says, deacons likewise, or if you have likewise deacons, and then it says, must, must. The temptation is going to be to do this. Well, nobody's perfect, right? Well, nobody's perfect. And then we start to wiggle and squirm and we get a little bit uncomfortable because the qualifications seem like they're like almost impossible But this is what God has said, and this is the word that I want to emphasize right now to drive this point home. Must. These must be a part of the life of a deacon. This is the qualities, the characteristics. They are non-negotiables. And that first one is men of dignity. They have a sacredness and seriousness about them because they understand, listen, they understand the seriousness of this life and of Christ himself. And the message of the gospel. And so I put this, probably oversimplified. They are spiritually serious. It's that simple. Ser- they are spiritually serious. In every state of their life, in every part of their life, they're spiritually serious. They're men of dignity. Because if you're spiritually serious, it's going to affect the way that you live. Amen? Amen. Secondly, I I need to not spend as much time on each one, so I'm going to speed up a little bit. And everybody said, (laughs) not double-tongued, not double-tongued. This is not just the word that you think about when you think about double-tongued, which is what? Lying or, okay, looking for a G word. Thinking about somebody going behind and there we go. But it includes all those, right? Lying, gossiping. Um, I came up with a very lame <laughs> translation, not two-tongued. It's literally not double-tongued. That's, that's, that's it, not two-tongued. But I think about literally somebody that has two tongues. And the idea is this, that they sound spiritual and they sound pious at church and they say all the right things and they sound godly, but then they go home or they go to their job and they're saying something totally different. Or it's somebody that says something to somebody in church and then they go to somebody else in the church and they say something different. That's happened within, within this church with somebody that we hired. This was a long time ago. Many of you didn't even know this person. And we had to let that person go because of that problem. Because they said something this way, but didn't say it to the other person, and didn't say it to me. And it was this idea of speaking doubly, speaking different to one person and speaking in another way to another person. And it's this, what we would say is two-face, but this is two-tongued. <laughs> they don't say one thing to one person and another thing to someone else. That's a requirement of a deacon. They cannot have that problem. Instead, their speech is consistent no matter where they are and no matter who they are speaking to. Why would that be important? Duh. Exactly. That is a huge trust issue. And that is going to be found out very quickly because people talk and that will bring dishonor to the Lord. So they are not two-tongued. The third thing that we see in verse 8 It says, deacons likewise must be men of dignity, not double-tongued. It says, or addicted to much wine. I put not addicted to much wine. 
The literal meaning is to occupy oneself uh, with or to turn one's mind to. Now, this one is a bit uh, complicated because we have to take culture and context into consideration. It's a lot of C's. Culture, context, into consideration. Why does Paul not tell Timothy, don't, don't drink any wine? Why doesn't he just say that? I'm open to feedback. Okay, so what would that indicate? That wine in that time was looked at, to, in some regards, especially the stronger wine, was looked at medicinal purposes. But what was the majority of drink in that day? Was it Aquafina? Yeah. And the water, for the most part, was laden with impurities and would often make people sick, and so they would add wine to their water uh, so that way it would kill off any bacteria or harmful um, things within the water. And, and so it would be natural for, for Paul not to say, don't drink any wine, because that would almost be impossible in that day and age. But the overall idea here is, in fact, total abstinence, especially from strong drink, s- strong alcoholic beverages. So we're talking about, now we bring this into our current context, and if we just take the Word of God as it is, we can say it's okay for a deacon to have a glass of wine, yes or no. Now, before you answer, think very hardly, very clearly, very in-depthly, not, listen, not just about this passage, because according to this passage, that would seem to be... But even if you just go back a little bit further, I'm giving you some hints in this same chapter. Any ideas? Any thoughts? Was that? That's it. Above reproach, which is blameless, which in our context, in our day and age, in this culture, if you see somebody at a bar, what do you think? Not always good things, right? Naturally, you kind of tend to think the wrong things, right? That maybe, I don't know, they're either drunk or they have a problem. No matter how you look at it, no matter how, no matter how you spin it. Now listen, this is not for the general congregation. This is for deacons, leaders in the church, who are to be above reproach. These men are to abstain from things that might stain them. They are to abstain from those things that might stain them and stain the name of Christ and stain the church that they are associated with. And so when he says, not addicted to much wine, he's literally saying, don't associate with that at all. And I would even go far as far to say, this is someone who doesn't drink. Just, just don't even, don't walk the line. That, that is not the heart of a person who should be elevated to the, one of the highest uh, offices in ministry, the office of deacon. Make sense? Remember, we're doing things contextually. And that is one of the things that um, a lot of people have a problem with because of social drinking and those things. Um, and I won't go into, we can go in further, but we're just going to keep moving for time's sake. Um, number four, not found fond of sordid gain. This is, he must not use his office as a means to make money. If somebody tries to do that here, you ain't going to make much. <laughs> okay. Uh, he must not use his office as a means to make money. Why? Because in the early church, who handled the money?
in general too, not just in not just in Acts, not not just in Jesus' time, and not just in, but in the Gospels and in uh, not the Gospels in the uh, epistles. Excuse me. It was the disciples. It was the deacons of the church. Um, and then you're right, though. We, that's a beautiful example. Judas abused his power, and his character was one of uh, wanting to be a person of, I think, status and to have money. So my simple translation is doesn't love money slash things. Why would I add things in there? Because in our day and age, it's the same thing, right? Um, It's a person who is not looking out, looking for opportunities to get wealthy or to get rich or to abuse a situation um, and, and surprisingly, you might think, oh, this, this, this doesn't happen that much. We've had people come into this church off the street, and they want to find out, how can I become a member? I mean, the f- very first time they step through the doors, it's almost the first question out of their mouth. And I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> you don't know anything about us, right? And then, how do you become a deacon? What? <laughs> Those are red flags, red flags, red flags, right? Because there are literally people out there who all they think about is how they can get rich, how they can get more money. Um, And so obviously we want to steer away from those type of people in this position. Um, What is a good indicator that a person is not beholden to money or that a person is uh, not tempted in that? In that sense, what's a, what, from a pastoral point, from a church standpoint, what would be a good indicator that that is not a problem for someone? Say it loud, Jay. Yeah, they tithe, they give, especially consistently. If they give consistently and they give sacrificially, the Bible says where your flip them. There you go. You had you had the right idea. Yeah. So, so where your treasure is, your heart will be also. And so if somebody is continually giving to the church uh, over a long period of time, that is a good indicator that they are not in love with money, but they understand that money is from the Lord and they are stewards of what God has given to them. And so that is the type of person that we want to look for to become uh, a deacon. Placing someone with priorities and loves, uh, someone who loves things or money in a position where they will often handle money is, to say the least, not wise and will also increase their temptations. Um, Now, this translates also to things. You know, I talk about tithe, but I'm going to, I don't want to embarrass Mr. Ray. Mr. Ray uses not only his time and his talents, but all of his stuff ever since I've been here, from his vehicles to his tools, uh, same thing with David Adams. Um, I mean, it's just it's just all, it's basically like it's the churches. You need it for the church, use it. Or he uses it himself on the church, whether it be lawnmowers or weed eaters or hedge trimmers or whatever it might be. And so that is a good indication that they're not in it for the money. And they're also really, really, really rich. If you weren't up here, if you didn't see up here, I was winking. Just kidding. But it simply means they don't, they don't covet money above the things of God. And so we need to be looking for men like that. Verse uh, number 9 gives us the next one. It says, holding to the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. That's a doozy. What does that mean? Well, the mystery of the faith is basically speaking of... Um, did I do a, the mystery of the faith is basically speaking of the entire New Testament revelation. Because... In the Old Testament, it was the mystery that was hidden. It was concealed. In the New Testament, it's the mystery revealed. And what is it specifically, church? What is the mystery? Yeah, it's the mystery of the gospel and all that is included in that. That from Genesis 3.15 and even before that, before God created the heavens and the earth and formed the world, he had a plan from the beginning of time uh, to bring about Christ into this world and to have him be the Savior For all those who would trust in him. And there's so many implications of that. And so really what we're talking about here is, listen, doctrine. Talking about doctrine. A a deacon needs to be a person 
of the word. They need to know the word. Not every single thing, but they need to know generally that the word of God is about Christ from beginning to end and understand that God's plan for mankind for redemption is through Jesus Christ. And you see that thread line all throughout the Old Testament and you see it continue and come to fruition in the New Testament. And they know simple doctrines of the word of God, the plan of God, the incarnation of Christ in the virgin birth, um, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. These are, these are important doctrines that this person needs to know as a servant and as a leader in the church. Um, a deacon who does not know the Bible, this is Warren Wearsby, he said this, he says, a deacon who does not know the Bible is an obstacle to progress in a local assembly. I thought that was pretty profound. I'll read it again. A deacon who does not know the Bible is an obstacle to progress in a local assembly. Why? Because if they don't know the Bible, they'll always be doing things out of their own wisdom. And they'll try to steer the church in directions that the church is not to go because it's not according to the word of God. John MacArthur said it is not enough merely to believe the truth. Deacons must also live it. This is in response to the latter part of that phrase. He says, holding to the mystery of the faith, doctrine, the gospel, the important things, right? But then he says what? With a clear conscience. What does that mean? The conscience, your conscience does one of two things. It either, I didn't mean for that to be that loud. It either beats you over the head, you're doing something bad, or, hey, that's good. You have no reason to be ashamed. Good job, right? It supports what you're doing. And here, he says, holding to the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. It means that they're living from the gospel. They don't just know doctrine, they live it. And so they have a clear conscience. They don't have a guilty conscience. So it's doctrinally sound and lives it. That's what we should be looking for in deacons. They know the word of God and they live the word of God. And therefore they have a clean conscience before God. They don't just believe the gospel. They live from the gospel to the point that they have a clear and clean conscience. 2 Corinthians 1.12, Paul talks about this. At first, this sounds like a prideful thing. He says, for our proud confidence, doesn't this sound a little bit like braggadocious already? He says, for our proud confidence is this, the testimony of our conscience. He says, we're confident in knowing that we have a clean conscience. We're, we don't feel guilty. That in holiness and godly sincerity, not in fleshly wisdom, here's where he gives the credit and glory to God, but in the grace of God, we have conducted ourselves in the world and especially towards you. He says, I have confidence in everything I've done. Why? Not because of my flesh, but because of the grace of God in me, because I followed the word of God, and I didn't just teach the word of God, I lived it out, and my conscience is clear. That should be the attitude and mentality of a deacon. They live from the gospel to the point that their conscience is clear. All right, next one we see in verse 10, it says, these men must also be first, what? Tested. Tested. So we take them into a back room. We hook them up to some electric. An electrical, you know, get a battery out, and get, uh, get some water out with a towel and put it over their head, ask them all the right doctrinal questions, make sure that they answer. I've gone too far with this joke. <laughs> First be tested means ongoing tests before becoming a deacon. So what's the time period? Somebody tell me in that passage what the time period is. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't tell us what the time period is, right? So what do you think the time period should be? Yeah, that's, that's the first thing. And it should be obvious to us that it's before they become a deacon. You don't make them a deacon and then let's see how they do. No, they're tested before they become a deacon. So time-wise, time, time wise, what are we talking? A couple months, a couple years? Okay, yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't have a disagreement with that, but it's still the question is, so how long do we go there? Well, it's basically when you observe that they have consistently lived, as the scripture says, above reproach. That's the 
That's the last line of verse 10. Listen to it. These men must also first be tested, then let them serve as deacons if they are beyond reproach. How long does it take to find out if somebody's above or beyond reproach? It takes as long as it takes. You, we're not going to burn anybody to <laughs> test them. <laughs> All right. I could see that. I'm trying to think if there's an instance where somebody wouldn't be tested, but I, if they're a believer, I don't see that not happening. So just running through that from a logical standpoint, I, don't, I, don't, I, I agree with that statement. I think that's an aspect that we should definitely be looking at um, to see how they handle the trials of life and the suffering of life, because as a believer, um, that is definitely going to come. And... Uh, uh, I think that's true, but I think the focus here specifically in, in verse 10 is, it, I think it's speaking, because of the context, it's speaking of tested within the church. So I think, yes, tested by trials, so, we, so I guess it's a, it's, a, it's a dual nature. Outside of the church, how are they being, how are they, how are they responding to trials and things like that? And also inside the church, how is somebody tested inside the church? Well, they're tested by... Here, do this, please. Mm, no, thanks. Here, do this, please. Can I do it next month? Sure. Okay. Be here at 10 o'clock. Where are they? Nope. Didn't show up again. They're 10 minutes late. That's a lot more rudimentary in nature. It's not the real trials of life. But if they can't do the little things... They sure aren't going to do the big things. The big things being a deacon, right? Matthew 25, 21, his master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter in the joy of your master. And so they're to be proven and to be proven consistent and faithful servants within and without the church. So both in the church of God and outside in life. I think Linda brought up a good point with that. How do they handle just life in general? Have they, have they been tested and come through that fire, but also in the church? Are they, have they been given responsibility, even a little responsibility? And what have they done with that responsibility? And also not just have they passed that one test of responsibility, but have they, I would like more responsibility. And they've proven themselves and proven themselves. And you give them more and more, and they've continued to grow. Again, not perfection, but consistency when tested. So inside and outside of the church. All right. Comments? Questions so far? We're almost done. All right, where are we at? Number seven. Then let them serve as deacons if they are beyond reproach. So it says, then let them serve. There's our big word, serve. As deacons. Big word, if. It's conditional, if. If what? If they are beyond reproach. This is the same phrase that was talked about in chapter 3, verse 2, about the elders or about the pastors. Look at verse 2. An overseer then must be above reproach. It's that same idea. It means they have to be perfect in every single way. Amen? Say, no. You can tell Pastor Dave, no. <laughs> it simply means blameless. Okay, that there's nothing that's going to stick to them. There's no glaring 
thing out there that the world knows about or only their spouse knows about or only they know about that's not going to, oh, surprise, and bring dishonor to the Lord, right? They have to be above reproach, blameless, and there's no glaring habitual sin in their life that can bring shame on the name of Christ or on the church. MacArthur says it like this, no blot on their lives, nothing for which they could be accused. Some examples, anybody? You get a phone call. This didn't really happen. I'm making it up. At the church. Of course, I'm Baptist church. I'm looking for so-and-so. Okay, uh, they go to our church, but they don't work here. Can I help you somehow? They have an outstanding debt, and we blah, 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 blah. Stop harassing me. Quick, no. Um, if somebody is in debt, like that commercial, or like you used to say, up to their eyeballs, that could potentially, it's not necessarily a sin, but it could potentially bring shame and reproach on the name of Christ and on the church if they're put in a position of leadership. Because if they can't handle their own finances, how are they going to handle the finances of the church? How are they going to learn to serve in that way? Right? It's not a complete disqualifier, but it's a red flag. Um, other examples of being beyond reproach, hopefully you don't see him out at a bar. <laughs> I'm going backwards. I need to go forwards. Uh, blameless means that they are proven blameless, that they have over a track record proven themselves uh, to not have any quote-unquote skeletons in the closet. Because that, we see that all the time now, especially with the media, this pastor's this, and this pastor's disqualified, and this pastor's fired, and this pastor stepped down because of fill in the blank, right? So their lives are to be exemplary and to be beyond reproach. Any questions on that one? Not perfection. Nobody's perfect. But there's no glaring fault in their life to which they could bring shame to the name of Christ. All right, eight, and then this is verse 12 again. Deacons must be husbands of only one wife. This is literally the same, the same phrase that we talked about when we talked about pastors in verse number two, where it says an overseer then must be above reproach, the husband of one wife. And it was translated as what? For 10,000 points. Very close. And that's right. Yes. A one, one, you said a man, one man, woman, but you meant a one, <laughs> you meant a one woman man. One woman men. It, it literally means that they are faithful to their spouse, listen, both in sexuality, physically, that they're not cheating or having an affair, but also emotionally, they're not flirtatious in nature. They don't get in emotional relationships with people of the opposite sex. There is no hint of unfaithfulness in their life. That's what it's saying. They cannot have that because the moment somebody sees that, it's going to uh, bring a blot on their life and possibly bring them down and bring the church down and bring the name of Christ down. So it's the same as in chapter 3, verse 2. They must be faithful to their wives in their actions and in their minds. All right, uh, number nine, in verse 12, it says, they also are to be good managers of their children and their own household. Manager means what? Don't think about the manager at Subway. <laughs> what are we talking about here? What you, and what did you say? Both are accurate. Overseer, leader, a, a good word is ruler, right? God has given men in the home the the off the yeah the office of, of to, to rule or to preside over and so they are the spiritual leaders of the home um, and then he says he says of course over their children now a question comes up and the question is Terry how old's your child uh oh forty <laughs> three is that right is that what you said fifty three what seventy four you guys don't know, do you? <laughs> He's older than me, right? He's like, does he have a wife? Does he have children? Is he of Terry's household anymore? 
we're not going to hold Terry accountable for, for, for what his child is doing now that he has his own family, his own life, his own household, right? And so I think there's some common sense that needs to be applied here. Um, but when Terry was raising him and when you guys were raising him, it needs to be in an environment where Terry was a spiritual leader and is raising his wife, his, I said his wife, raising his children and guiding his wife. The Bible says that the husband is to um, basically bathe his spouse in the word of God, to wash her in the word. And so it's the spiritual leadership that should uh, just preside over the entire household, um, not just the children, but the wife also. And it says, and their own household. Household here, we talked about this last time too. It includes the family, but it's also talking about how that person deals with money. Listen, how they deal with possessions, how they make decisions. It's, it's, that's household here. It's not just people. It's the collective way they lead and guide the home in every area. Because you don't want a fool in the home to become a fool that's leading a church. Amen? It's harsh, but it's understandable why God would put these into place. Um, so it's a, I just said a godly and good leader of his house. All right, so those are the qualifications. That's a lot to absorb, right? And sometimes when you're thinking about somebody to nominate, it's hard to, to think about all these things, but it's important to do so. Um, now, the rewards are found in verse 13, it says, for those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a high standing and great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. So if you want to become a deacon, first of all, think about everything that you just, that you just heard. And then secondly, your reward is what? High standing. What does that mean? Yeah, thought well of or respected. Literally, I think the phraseology here is like they're, you, they're a step up. We would say we put them on a what? pedestal. It's not a prideful thing because the Word of God says that those who humble themselves, He will lift up. And that's what's happening with the person who has the right heart, a servant's heart as a deacon. The Lord is elevating them to a leadership position. Um, and so that's the right reward for them. It's a, it's a respect um, thing. It's a held in high regard type of uh, attitude. But also He says um, th they are also... Uh, have great confidence and faith that is in Christ Jesus. So the first reward is respect, held in high regard, put up on a pedestal. But the second is a product of that, great confidence in the faith. It means that they will have boldness and confidence. And then in the faith that is in Christ here is a reference to the family of God. So they're going to be respected within the family of God. And their respect and how they handle themselves, listen, is going to lift up the rest of the church. That's what good leaders do, right? They lift up those around them. You think about Michael Jordan. Why were his teams so good? His teams were so good because he lifted everybody else around him to play at his level, right? And that's one of the rewards in actuality that the Bible says is of a, a deacon is they're respected, but it's also they see the fruit of their labor amongst the people that they lead, that they serve. They also, too, be, become servants of Christ and love Christ, and the whole church is edified, and that is one of the rewards of a deacon. Questions? Thoughts? Comments? Are you sure? This is your final chance. All right, then we will pray.